Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Friday, July 5th. Good to have you on board, everyone. Happy belated Independence Day. In today's episode, we're going to talk about the July issue of Proceedings, our annual focus on naval aviation. This episode is brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. All right, joining me today in our virtual studio are my colleagues, Bill Bray, the deputy editor of Proceedings, and Brian O'Rourke, the senior editor for Proceedings. Bill, Brian, happy Friday. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. All right, the July issue is out. Naval Aviation, we've got a cool uh, image of a, uh, a Marine F-35B on the cover. We've got a lot of great content in this issue. There'll be bonus distribution. A couple thousand copies will be sent out to uh, Reno, where it will be in every participant in uh, the annual Hook uh, Symposium out there, Tail Hook Symposium. Uh, at the, not at the Nugget this year. It's going to be at the Grand Sierra Resorts, the first time moving away from uh, the Nugget uh, to a, a newer, brighter, shinier hotel. But um, uh, we're always happy to be there with a the booth at, at Hook and also to have uh, copies of proceedings and some copies of Naval History to uh, give out to the folks who, uh, to, who attend the Naval Aviation uh, Symposium. Um, who wants to go first and talk about a, an article that you uh, worked on or you particularly uh, enjoyed from this issue? I'd love to dive in because um, Michael Ackman's article is uh, always near and dear to my heart. Anytime you can have an amphibious aircraft or a wing and ground effect craft or just a straight up seaplane, I am going to be happy. It's no secret how much I love these things and how unhappy I am that we don't own any. Um, Lieutenant Commander Ackman is actually a medical officer and he wrote about these. He didn't emphasize casualty evacuation, although he certainly, uh, certainly mentioned it, but he was basically making the case for using it for some of the things that other authors have, have advocated for with us. Um, logistics, uh, refueling, uh, moving around the Pacific in ways that are faster than and, and, and can be done from longer ranges than surface options, um, but not putting stress on things that require improved runways and things like that. Um, just a, a, another smart article on this topic. Um, I think if the authors keep beating the drum, we will keep giving them a studio in which to record that drum beating. And maybe we can hope that the Navy will eventually hear that sound and take it seriously. Um, he doesn't get into this. One of the things that I have heard repeatedly from people in industry and uh, advocates within the service is that um, for seaplanes and in particular for wing and ground aircraft, uh, one of the problems is that nobody owns them in the Navy. NAVC looks at them and goes, that's great, but that's an aircraft. And its function is that of an aircraft. And nav air looks at them and goes, "That's great, but yeah, it flies, but it's really, it's really more of a boat. Uh, it does what boats do for us. Uh, it, it, it ties up to piers, so it's not really an aircraft. Um, so getting a sponsor for it is a challenge. I think the silo concept, uh, where we have distinct roles for things." There needs to be somebody above all these different silos who can say, hey, you and this silo, you and that silo, talk to each other, get this done. Um, but right now, the people who can do that ha aren't just overseeing those little silos. They're overseeing the whole Navy. And so it becomes difficult to, to make that happen. Yeah, and the, the uh, article for our listeners who are not watching this on YouTube, the article is titled Amphibiosity is Up in the Air. And uh, Brian, the image is a, uh, a US-2 uh, seaplane that is a Japanese seaplane? The Shinmaiwa US-2, yes. Um, it's a it's a big thing. It's a four-engine beast. Uh, the Japanese Maritime Self-Defense Force owns, I think they own eight with a few more on order. 
Uh, there's been a lot of advocacy for the U.S. to buy a few from Japan and then to uh, license build some more here. Um, it's like all seaplanes, it's ugly, which makes it pretty in my mind. Um, it's, they've been, they are based, some of them are based at Iwakuni alongside U.S. forces. So um, Marines get to look at them every day. Uh, the U.S. Air Force uses them in, uh, for search and rescue when they've needed it. In fact, the uh, Pacific Air Force commander six or seven years ago had been rescued by one when he was an F-16 pilot in Japan back in the 90s. And he actually, uh, the article mentions this, he actually spent uh, a few minutes meeting with the pilot of the US-2 who had rescued him. Um, there's nothing like it for search and rescue. Uh, an MH-60 is a great SAR platform as long as you're within 100 or 150 miles of the incident when it happens. Um, otherwise, it needs some place to refuel between here and there. And uh, this Air Force general was recovered seven or 800 miles off sea with no ship, uh, offshore with no ships anywhere in sight. So unclear how he could have been rescued in a timely manner without a long range amphibious aircraft. Yeah, interesting. Um, and as you as you point out, this is a capability that uh, the, the Navy had seaplanes um, and, and a lot of them in World War II. Uh, Naval aviation started with seaplanes and then we got rid of them. The last ones uh, were phased out of the Navy in 1967 and out of the Coast Guard in like 1984 or so. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, a, lot, a lot of people are talking about this, you know, that the need to bring back especially with distributed maritime operations for a bunch of different types of missions uh, and for moving, you know, Marines uh, around in, in the, the way that EABO talks about doing that. There's a lot of capability that seaplanes bring that other cap other types of aircraft just do not bring or surface craft. 200 knots at a hundred feet is a very different insertion approach. Um, at 200 knots at 100 feet from 1,000 miles away unrefueled is a very, very different insertion method than anything anybody else can do. You don't know. You, yes, you might know where they could start, but they could start from any island in the Pacific if you could get a fuel bladder on that island and not much more. Um, there are a couple of manufacturers. The most common aircraft the U.S. Navy has ever used is the PBY Catalina and the Grumman Albatross. Uh, they're both fairly large. They both have fairly ca uh, good passenger capability and payload capability. Neither one has been built in a very long time. Two companies have purchased the FAA type certificates for them, which basically says, okay, you're, all, you're authorized to manufacture this without going through a new, we have to certify your plant, but we don't have to certify your airplane. Um, it can cost $100 million to certify a new airplane uh, with the FAA um, in just in the um, small transport category, and it can be hundreds of millions for another thing. So if you start with a type certificate, you start by saving 100 to 200 to $300 million. Um, one is Austra in, based in Australia. That's uh, somebody who bought the Grumman type certificate. And there's a company here in the U.S. called the Catalina Aircraft Trust that owns it. They're both looking for money. It appears the Grumman company is a little further along. They've been promising to break ground on a plant in Australia. So. Um, but a proper investment from the Navy and, and or elsewhere would get these things ready to go to market sooner. You can put a new engine on an airplane with a type certificate. You just have to go through a flight test program. Again, it's not a new airplane. Put a glass cockpit in there, put a new engine on, uh, on it, um, and you're basically ready to go, you know, and you can build an airplane of that size in a year or two. It's not, uh, it's not a, it's not an airliner. It's not, you know, 175 million or $300 million piece of hardware. It's in the millions. The Shin Maiwa, I think is a $30 million aircraft. I might have that number wrong, but it's somewhere in that order of magnitude. Anyway, it's, I, I, I can and will talk all day about these if you let me. I love them. Uh, it's, there is, don't sit next to me in a bar tonight because I will just be 
uh, leaning over and saying, you know what we need in this country. So, <laughs> All right, uh, Bill, what was one of your articles that you worked on this month? Uh, so one of them was um, an article called, the title of it is To Secure Undersea Cables, Take Lessons from the British Empire's All Red Line. There it is. Uh, the authors are Captain uh, Douglas uh, Burnett, re Navy retired, and Kristen Burdan, um, a, co a former colleague of his who's a uh, lawyer by training. And um, Doug's written for us before about the undersea um, cable system um, and, and its uh, vulnerabilities. Um, this article is heavy history. Um, what is the British All Red Line? So in the um, British Empire days, late 19th century, early 20th century, the maps that uh, were generally produced that showed the British Empire were red. So when they had laid um, telegraph, underwater telegraph cables to connect the empire, um, it became known, that became known as the all red line. Okay, so um, the point is that the British realized pretty quickly that as they moved to a new and quicker way to communicate with their far flung um, outposts of the, of the empire, uh, there was a vulnerability there um, in if the cables get cut. And um, they did some heavy analysis on how many cuts would require to isolate this place or that place. Um, and in fact, it was a vulnerability in the First World War that uh, the British uh, successfully mitigated to, to a large degree, um, and it hurt Germany more than, than the British. Now, that was just Telegraph. Today's undersea cable systems carries a lot more information. It's the financial system of the world um, rides on it. We all know this. Um, so there are some significant differences and there have been cable cuts by accident um, in recent years uh, that have affected, temporarily affected uh, the movement of information. Um, so, but they point out, um, Doug and Kristen, that there are some uh, lessons from the history that you sh that we can take when we look at examining different uh, vulnerabilities in different places. And Kristen had built this um, pretty cool um, uh, map in, uh, in Google Maps um, uh, that shows the, um, the current underwater cable, worldwide cable system, wh which different companies control different parts of it, uh, where they terminate. And we couldn't obviously put that we couldn't put that in the print magazine, but in the uh, online version, there's a link, hyperlink you can click on. It takes you right to it. Uh, so I would encourage readers to, to check that out. Cool. All right. Uh, back to aviation for a minute. I want to uh, just point out that uh, Admiral Sam Paparo, he's the uh, commander of U.S. Indo-PACOM, I think the most senior naval aviator still on active duty right now. Uh, he wrote two pieces in this article. The first one is uh, titled Naval Aviation, Our Ethos Defines Us. This is a, a short little piece. It kind of kicks off the aviation coverage where he talks about, um, you know, the, the different things or, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the character traits that make up the aviation ethos from hard work, humility, self-assessment, teamwork, confidence, persistence, and faith. And uh, one of the ones that... Um, resonated with me the most, and I spent much of my career as a naval intelligence officer working with aviation commands, an F-18 squadron, a carrier air wing, a carrier strike group, uh, uh, and even a, an analytical team that looked at aviation issues uh, when I was a lieutenant. Um, but he uh, he talks about, I really like this, this piece of it, self-assessment. Critical self-assessment is the basis for the safe and effective conduct of our dangerous business. The highest expression of this is self-identifying our errors so others may learn from them. We learn this habit in the earliest days of flight school and we take it with us to the fleet. The recent documentary on the Blue Angels show, and that's available on uh, Amazon Prime. If you haven't seen it, take it, check it out. It's a, it's a wonderful movie. Uh, shows how those, especially those at the pinnacle of the profession, constantly hone their edge through humble self-assessment and a brutal debrief. Uh, that's one of the things that just jumps out at you if you watch that book, that movie on the Blue Angels is just how uh, self-critical they are. There's no ego in it at all. There is just constantly, I could have done this better. I could have done that better. I was late with this. I was, I wasn't tight enough here. And uh, when and to to watch those new Blue Angels who get selected for the team, 
almost almost acting like plebes. I remember, you know, the, the nerves I had coming into the Naval Academy as a plebe too many years ago, and we just had the plebes. The current class of 28 arrived last last month, or just a couple uh, ten days ago or so. And that Blue Angels movie reminded me of that that sort of feeling like I don't know if I'm up for this. Uh, and and Admiral Paparo pointing out that 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 um, humble critical self-assessment that that naval aviation has to do all the time uh, is a key part of you know staying safe and doing what they do. Um, the other piece that he wrote for us is a more substantive piece. It's titled Aircraft Carriers Still Indispensable. Uh, and Bill, you pointed out this morning, you know, in the comments online, it's getting some, some critical comments. Uh, uh, you know, a few people pointing out that this is maybe perhaps an article similar to, uh, you know, the battleship admirals of the 1930s not wanting to uh, move ahead with naval aviation. And as Admiral Paparo, Sort of echoing those, you know. Hey, we we have carriers. We need carriers, and and uh, we'll always be a, a carrier navy. Um, but a couple of the things that he points out, and, and I I think uh, some of those online comments are a little bit unfair, because Admiral Papard does in his article talk about the need to constantly invest in capabilities that will allow aircraft carriers to stay lethal and relevant. He doesn't say, oh yeah, we're, you know, we have carriers, we need carriers, we'll always have carriers and carriers are the best thing ever. He he points out pretty critic, critically, pretty self-critically that there's an imperative to continue to develop and advance um, the defensive capabilities, the ability to move, shoot, communicate. Uh, but a couple of the things that I thought were um, really relevant points that he makes. Uh, the first one, and it relied on um, the article by uh, Tal Manville that we published a few years ago. He mentions, uh, Admiral Paparo mentions the immense weapons capacity in a CVN's magazines, 10 times the weapons capacity in one of the, uh, you know, the light carriers or lightning carriers, a WASP or America class, LHA, LHD. Um, and the other thing he points out is that there's a lot of discussion with you know, the Marine Corps EABO, the Air Force's Agile Combat Employment, um, the Marine, the, the Army, we had, uh, you know, General Flynn um, on the show a couple of months ago, the Army's talk about multi-domain operations and task forces. And all of those are mobility um, ideas for the other services. But Admiral Papara points out, you know, an aircraft carrier uh, has more firepower than any of those capabilities. And it is constantly moving and can move, you know, 30 knots, uh, you know, hundreds of miles in a day, whereas those other capabilities are move, set up, shoot, take down, have to move again. Um, and one of the one of the, the key quotes is that the targeting uh, the targeting uh, solution for a fixed point on land was kind of solved on the day that the earth cooled. So I, I love that kind of throwaway line from the admiral. Um, one other thing that I, I enjoyed as I worked on the uh, the editing with Admiral Paparo, he wrote this himself. This was not a staff product. Uh, his voice comes through very strong. Uh, and I also enjoyed, I was, as I was working on this with him and preparing for the, the podcast with General McKenzie on his book, The Melting Point, Paparo was McKenzie's J3 at CENTCOM. And there was a great, art, a great uh, quote in this from General McKenzie, where he, in uh, as uh, the CENTCOM commander in 2019, uh, talks about Iran was planning a series of escalatory attacks and keeping close watch on U.S. force structure in CENTCOM. The quote was, we also knew the Iranians had been emboldened by a series of recent decisions to greatly reduce U.S. force presence. Most significantly, we no longer had the continuous presence of an aircraft carrier and its accompanying ships. Aircraft carriers are unique icons powerful symbols of U.S. commitment and power, and the Iranians carefully noted when they were and were not in the theater. Uh, so carriers still indispensable. Admiral Paparo, uh, thoughts from you guys? Well, I think, um, you know, the dilemma I see with the Navy is in a high-end in a high -end fight with, say, China, the carrier's vulnerability is clear and um, and that's a that's a huge challenge for the Navy. Um, but 
getting rid of carriers doesn't necessarily um, or stop building them or whatever. And it doesn't, um, it, it hurts us in other ways. You know, the Eisenhower's um, performance for months in the Red Sea, the U.S. ability to put power ashore against the Houthis um, would have been much harder without the Eisenhower there. Um, first of all, you got to fly further um, from bases in, in other in other countries. And those countries can say, I think, in some cases, say no <laughs> or stop doing it. Um, and uh, so there's there's a permission issue there. Um, I don't think that's a big lift in the Middle East, but it, it is a, a factor. And um, and, uh, and, and, and like you said, the mobility to be able to, you know, move around and strike different things. It's uh, now what's the effect we've had on the Houthis. I mean, that's a debate, debatable point. Could we do more? All that's fine. But the fact is, is that having a carrier there was a, a very useful um, power projection tool for the United States. So, um, you know, could we build them cheaper? Could we have modified the Nimitz class instead of gone to a new Ford class with a, that exorbitant cost? Although those are all great questions and, and uh, it certainly can be debated. But uh, to not have an aircraft carrier and to equate the carrier's um, relevance to, you know, kind of the battleship um, era and, and, and hanging on to that too long or whatever, I don't think that quite works for me in, uh, for a number of reasons. So I partly disagree. Mostly I agree with you. Um, one of the things I haven't heard discussed, I'm sure it's being discussed, it just hasn't been with an earshot of me, is a lot of our assumptions about targeting. And we had General Smith uh, a few weeks ago say, you know, if you can be seen, you can be targeted. If you can be targeted, you'll be killed. Um, the Houthi situation suggests to me that maybe little mobile things, uh, mobile bases are more persistent than we thought they could be. Um, we've expended a lot of ordnance. We've shot down a lot of drones. Uh, they're still shooting. Uh, the, the bad guys are still shooting at ships, and they're still hitting ships from time to time. They're also missing ships a lot of the time. And they're missing ships that don't have meaningful or any self-defense measures aside from whatever top cover we're giving them. I don't, I don't know what that means. I don't know. Is it, is it simply that, you know, three guys with a, with a Toyota technical and a missile launcher on the back of it are just too hard to target, but okay, then maybe that's a tactic that we'll see adopted in the first Island chain. Um, I, I, the contrary is similar. Maybe it's harder to actually hit one of these things, even with a high-tech weapon, than we know. Um, some of these ballistic missiles that the Houthis are shooting are hitting moving targets at sea. That was once considered an extraordinarily difficult problem to solve, and it isn't anymore. Um, with you know ballistic missiles hitting ships at sea, they're missing. Uh, the ships are even the ships that are being hit by those that are not aircraft carriers designed to, you know, have their shock testing measured in how far from a megaton nuclear blast you have to be to not do too much damage to the ship. And it's a few miles, right? It's not, not, <laughs> not uh, furlongs per fortnight away. So I, I don't know. I, I think maybe, maybe the death of the carrier isn't quite upon us yet. And as Bill Bray said, I think maybe the capability the carrier brings uh, is better than we think. We still need to improve the legs of the aircraft on the carrier. Uh, and the MQ-25 is a very expensive way to do it. It'll certainly save wear and tear on the Super Hornets, but I'm not sure it gives you any more striking power given the deck size that it takes up. I think you have to take away about as many Harriers, uh, Harriers, uh, many as many Super Hornets as you would use for buddy stores uh, to do that, and it doesn't have a huge capacity. So that's a big problem for it. It's a solvable problem, but it's not been solved yet. Yeah, though this debate is not over. You know, this uh, Admiral Papar's piece makes a strong 
a strong case. And, and uh, obviously he is, uh, he is a naval aviator. He is a Top Gun grad. He commanded a carrier uh, a strike group and a carrier air wing. Uh, and so, you know, it's not surprising that he makes a strong argument for aircraft carriers. Uh, but he also does say we need to continue to invest in their survivability. Uh, and he also points out uh, another thing that isn't often in the discussions is the uh, space weight and power capability. So he mentions, you know, that the only a carrier offers the space weight and power capacity to do new things, such as, you know, perhaps additive manufacturing of cheap drones uh, by the hundreds or maybe thousands in the future on the carrier um, and have it as a, you know, a base for them. Um, he, he mentions its utility in a couple of uh, key humanitarian assistance disaster relief missions, the uh, Tomodachi uh, 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 Japanese earthquake and tsunami, um, the, uh, the Bandar Achai uh, tsunami in, in uh, 2000, I think that was in, in, uh, in 2000. Um, but carriers have a lot of capacity, a lot of ability to move quickly and, uh, and relocate and to be difficult to target uh, it's not. It doesn't put an end to the discussion or, or the debate, but it certainly makes some very strong uh, points. And I think one of the strongest points is, you know, from his perspective as the Indo-PACOM commander, he mentions those other service capabilities and new, um, you know, uh, operational tactics, if you will, EABO and ACE, MDO, and he says all good, and and he's a fan of all of them. Um, but the uh, none of them none of them obviate the need for carriers. So enough said on that one. It's good good piece though, worth reading, worth worth I think the the uh, discussion that that uh, is taking place, um, and it's just another uh, another strong point in the uh, ongoing debate about you know aircraft carriers, how many, how long, what's the utility, what's the value, what what types should we have, all of those things. Well, you mentioned additive manufacturing, so I'd like to talk quickly about the Lieutenant Commander um, Dan Bell's article, at Coast Guard Lieutenant Commander Dan Bell's article about additive manufacturing. And I noticed in the Chinfo clips this morning, um, there was an article about the um, additive manufacturing they're doing as, as part of RIMPAC. They have these Connex boxes um, uh, in Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, and they're producing parts um, to support the exercise. The Naval Postgraduate School is heavily involved in that and um, looking at, um, you know, how to do it, how to do it better, all the issues you deal with it. Now, those are ashore in Kaneohe Bay. Dan Bell is talking about doing this on ships. We published uh, AM articles in the in the past and proceedings. Um, my, at least the ones I've edited, I remember they're, they're kind of long on exuberance and short on like this, this the hard stuff about this kind of gloss over some of that and talk about the future and a lot of innovation, rah, rah. But Dan, I think, does a really good job in this article of laying out the challenges with this um, and the promise, like he says in the title, um, of, uh, of doing this. Um, it is, there's a lot to think through when you think about producing parts at sea um, and, you know, the vulnerabilities of doing that both on ships themselves, uh, carriers are big, they, they have s more space and they, they probably can do, obviously can do more than a smaller ship, a destroyer. Um, but there are challenges with sea state, there are challenges with um, uh, temperature and humidity, um, all kinds of things. And as we know, anybody who's deployed in the Navy, you can get apart from Norfolk, Virginia to the Middle East in about 48 hours. I mean, it's, or even less. It's not, you know, that hard to get parts moved forward when you need them. Um, so when you're talking about producing parts on a ship, um, I mean, the additive manufacturing shop can only produce so many in so much time anyway. How much, how many parts do you need? And is it really gonna save you uh, time? Plus um, machines break. Um, you need redundancy at sea if you're not going to be able to bring this. You have to figure out, okay, what parts should we bring with us because we need them. We need to be able to replace them so fast that and and what can we what we can we potentially produce? Um, 
one of the ideas that Dan throws out is, hey, maybe the Navy should think about converting a couple of supply ships to be pure additive manufacturing ships. So these ships would float around with strike groups or whatever, and they would be like these uh, large machine shops. That would solve a lot of problems when it comes to you could outfit them, you know, to to, they, to make you think it'd be more stable. They're bigger ships. Um, you could, you know, work on the climate control better and all that. And you, know, you could have more efficiency doing it that way. Um, of course, there's a vulnerability there. What if that ship gets sunk, you know, in a in a conflict, or or uh, has a mechanical casualty and, and can't, you know, keep up with a, you know, so it's just an, an interesting article. I think it, it it provides a very balanced and well researched um, take on the the challenges of doing ad additive manufacturing at sea. There's there's a thing called roll pitch and yaw too, right? I mean. And some of these machines are pretty, uh, pretty precision manufacturing kinds of things. In a lab, you'll put them on vibration absorbing pads. Uh, what are you going to do? You, you know, you, you mentioned C state, but I mean that's really that's really what it comes down to. Although I do really like the idea of the USNS maker. You know, I think <laughs> I think that's. Um, I'm not sure. You're going to find the real maker nerds that I went to engineering school with willing to go to sea uh, to do that, but you never know. Yeah. When I was a student at the uh, National Defense University at the, what used to be called ICAF, now the Eisenhower School, about 12 years ago, uh, one of the tours we had was uh, to a, a manufacturer, a high-tech manufacturing capability for uh, for DOD. I, I believe it was Northrop Grumman facility up near uh, BWI Airport. And we uh, we went in and we saw you know I mean lots of people in the the, the white coats the uh, the clean rooms uh, and it was the first time I saw anything being additive uh, you, uh, you, a, an additive manufacturing process watching a machine actually make a uh, a metal part for um, a rocket motor and uh, it was cool I thought wow that's really amazing but it it, it was it was on shock mounted you know very. It, it don't don't get within five feet of it. There were a bunch of technicians around it, all in you know with the hair nets and the white coats, and it was in a in a clean room. Uh, and yeah, the idea that we're we're just going to put those capabilities on a, a Coast Guard cutter or a destroyer uh, that is lurching around in heavy seas uh, in the South China Sea and and create high tech parts to re, you know repair gas turbine engines or you know. Or, Aegis radar cells or something like that. Yeah, it, it, you got it. There's at least the requirement to uh, to pause and reassess there and say, well, what are the what are the, what's the reality of this? I and you still you still have a supply challenge, even if you could do it at sea regularly and and uh, you know produce high quality parts. You still need the feedstock. So the yeah. ships are going to have to resupply with feedstock, and how much can you carry and all that? So it, anyway, it's it's I, I found it to be a very good article. It's important to note he does, as Bill said at the outset, he does not simply throw cold water on the idea. He's he's very aware that there is utility and value in it, and he tries to spell out what that value is right now, and then how we get more out of it, rather than the additive manufacturing will change everything uh, hyperbole we get sometimes. Right. Right. All right. Anyone else have a uh, another article to chat about, talk about today? I'll just mention the um, the PEO article this month from PEO Aviation. Uh, we've been doing this series a little bit this year. Uh, we've tried to tie it into the theme of the issues where we connect with the program executive officer uh, from the program executive office for things that uh, that are part of that issue. And uh, this one was interesting because it didn't uh, simply say everything's wonderful. It said a fair amount of things are wonderful or things are better than you think. Uh, but it also said that what's helping them work is changing their approach to things. Um, they give the example, it was widely covered a couple months ago of uh, Hornets getting bigger loads of AIM-9X uh, Sidewinder missiles than they've been able to do. And that the flight certification process for that is something that normally could have taken months to do and it took a week after squadrons in the Red Sea asked for it. Uh, they managed to bring together a lot of different things, a lot of different PEOs and industry groups and, and uh, NAVAIR and whatnot to, to get it done quickly. Uh, 
so that was they sort of lead with that as a success story. And if you look at the photo, you'll see there's a whole bunch of AIM 9Xs, not just on the wing pylons on the Super Hornet about to launch. Um, but they, they made it clear that the process needs input from industry. Uh, and industry needs to sometimes lead the acquisition process in the sense of uh, we have to tell you what isn't going right. And you have to be okay with us telling you uh, what isn't going right. Both sides have to, as the article puts it, I think, use the business school term, embrace the red. In other words, don't just magically pretend everything on your on your Gantt chart is green, but find the places and highlight the places where it isn't so you can fix those things. And not in a punitive way, not in a scream at anybody way, but in a, okay, great. Now we know this is a problem. How do we solve it? Not let's hide it and, you know, kick the can down the road. So, you know, I'm about to retire and let's wait till this, my successor is in this job because it's going to be a process, blah, blah, blah. So I thought it, there, there's some, there's some candor in it. Uh, there is, you know, there's, there's plenty of here's what we do and how we do. And I think that's useful to people who haven't been in that environment too, but there's some candor about, you know, we've developed processes for making the whole thing work a little bit better. Do we have more to do? Absolutely. But have we made some small steps forward? We have. Yeah. And Brian, I wanted to add that, uh, uh, the author, Rear Admiral John Lemon, he is Program Executive Office for Tactical Aircraft, so P-E-O-T, uh, and, and under his auspices, he mentions the uh, F-18 and EA-18 Program Office, PMA-265, uh, and your point about the, uh, the, the requirement to carry more AIM-9X on the Super Hornets uh, came from an urgent need from the Red Sea, from the Ike Strike Group as they were out there. Um, the AIM-9X was one of the tools that they were using to shoot down Houthi drones and missiles that were coming in at the uh, air, at the ships steaming in the Red Sea. And so uh, that was one of the most effective tools was actually air intercepts using AIM-9X against the uh, the Houthi weapons that were that were headed outbound. Um, and I also wanted to point out we we added this you know, getting the PEOs, inviting the PEOs to write for us. Uh, it was a suggestion from an old shipmate of mine last year at Tailhook, a guy named uh, Moby, uh, his call sign was Moby. And uh, Moby is now, he's retired F-18 pilot. He retired as an 05 head squadron command. Uh, he's gone into industry. One of the things he pointed out is in, in proceedings, he didn't see a place for a conversation for industry Evolving around, revolving around where how industry can fit better, uh, partner better with the Navy. And so uh, our, our thinking here was, let's invite the PEOs to talk about the biggest problems they're having, and then hopefully get industry to come in with with better ideas, or to engage earlier in the process. Perhaps engaging even in the process of setting the requirements, so that the requirements aren't pie in the sky and then lead industry to come up with uh, ideas that would require, you know, a gazillion dollars to solve. Kind of like um, the, the requirement for the LCS is to go 50 knots 20 odd years ago. Uh, and, and we found out later that if uh, industry had been brought into that earlier, they, they could have said, yeah, we can get 40 knots at a much lower cost point and a much lower engineering uh, risk uh, you know, risk point on the scale. Uh, but if you want 50 knots, boy, we're going to have to really do some, um, you know, some crazy engineering and crazy PowerPoint des power plant design things that led to some of the problems we saw, especially with the the earliest versions of, of both independence and, uh, and freedom class uh, LCSs. So anyway, for our listeners who are out there in industry, we hope you'll take a look at the PEO pages in proceedings uh, and we'd love to have you pitch in with uh, comment and discussion or with response articles uh, about this idea of, you know, how does industry and the Navy, particularly the program managers, how do they partner better? We know it's not seamless integration. So what we'd like to hear from each is uh, how to smooth the seams at least a little. Uh, that's that's the essence of what we're trying to get at here. And I think we've, we've, 
we're beginning to get a little of that from the PEO offices. It's it's tough. You've got to stand up and say, here's what we're not good at. And here's what industry isn't good at if this one if this is to be informative. And that's not the easiest thing to do in a public forum. We get that. But if we can get a little bit more of that from each side, I think everybody, including the C services, benefits. Yeah. And it that uh, echoes Admiral Paparo's comment at the start of a the need for a brutally honest debrief. You got to be completely honest. There's no rank in the debrief. There's no rank at the maintenance desk. Uh, you know, you just have to, everyone has to show up and say, this is going well and this is not going well. How do we fix it? How do we get better? And that's, uh, that's part of the mission of proceedings to be that open forum uh, for those discussions, those uh, hard, honest discussions to take place. All right, any last words? Apparently not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys, as always. Um, all right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast. This one brought to you by Booz Allen. Accelerate today's missions with tomorrow's technologies as the leader in providing AI solutions to the federal government and one of the world's largest cybersecurity providers, Booz Allen advances game-changing capabilities rapidly, ethically, and securely. Learn more at boozallen.com slash defense. If you're a member of the Naval Institute, thank you. Your support is important to everything we do. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today by going to usni.org slash join. In addition to receiving Proceedings Magazine, our members also receive the, U the new USNI News C-Scroll Weekly Newsletter, which is a member-only benefit filled with reporters' notebook items and insights that don't get reported anywhere else. Well, that's a wrap. Until next episode, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.